All right. So let, then now it's time to look at the next set of periodic trends in the periodic table. And the first one that we're going to take a look at in this video is ionization energy. All right, so ionization energy. This is the minimum amount the minimum amount of energy and we measure this energy in kilojoules per mole just like enthalpy that's required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom in its ground state. Okay. And we want atoms in the ground state specifically because they have very weak intermole intermolecular forces. And so we've we've kind of talked a little bit about intermolecular forces already, especially when we talked about the kinetic molecular theory of gases, that when you have gases that are, uh, when you have atoms that are in the gas state, they bounce off of each other like bouncy balls, so they don't necessarily feel attractions or repulsions. Now, albeit we know now that they do have some attractions and repulsions, but not as much as solids and liquids do. So that's kind of why we want atoms to be in the ground state, because they don't really have as many intermolecular forces, or they don't feel it as strongly as liquids and solids do. Now this number, this ionization energy, is really going to be measuring how tightly bound is that electron to the atom. And so the higher the number is, the higher the number, the more difficult it's going to be to remove an electron. Okay, and so this plot that we're taking, uh, this plot right be behind what we just talked about, kind of shows this. It's showing us, it's plotting the first ionization energy for each major from each element pretty much from helium from hydrogen all the way to radon so let's take a look at this what i'm <coughs> excuse me what we're going to do is take a look at the elements that are in a family first and then we'll look at a period so i'll tell you what let's pick out family 1a since they are right on the bottom so you've got lithium you got sodium you got potassium rubidium and cesium now, if I zoom in a little bit low, more, it looks, and it's not exact, but there's a trend that they seem to be going kind of down. So as the atomic number increases, the metals or the, the elements in that family tend to be, uh, tend to be getting smaller and smaller. So ionization energy, if, if I'm going to draw this on a periodic table, so let me, let me draw one real quick. Okay, so here's our, here's a simple periodic table. And then here's hydrogen, here's helium. So ionization energy increases as we go from the bottom to the top. Now, what if we want to go across a period? So let's take a look at period three. And here it is. I'm going to circle it. So here's potassium on the bottom, krypton on the top. And so while you've got a little bit of a hiccup right here, it tends to increase as you go from left to right across a period. So ionization energy increases as you go from bottom to top and from left to right, which is the same, if you remember, as effective nuclear charge. 
Okay, so effective nuclear charge and ionization energy are going to increase in the same direction, and it's going to be opposite from atomic radius. Okay, so uh, we can look at the first 20 ionization energies, and here's how this works. Let's take a look at lithium. Okay, so here's lithium. So the first ionization is 520, and then there's a big jump to the second one. So let me show you how this works. If we remove its one lithium's one valence electron, it's going to cost us 520 kilojoules. And at that point, at that point, lithium becomes isoelectronic with helium. And so it retains that noble gas configuration. So it's really happy. But if we force lithium ion to remove its second valence electron, so now it's going to break up its Iso, it's, it's noble gas configuration, it's going to cost us a lot of energy, 7,300 kilojoules. And so there, it's kind of nice in this table that you can actually see that nature prefers that certain atoms will lose, you know, lose electrons to get to a noble gas configuration and that's happy. And then if you try to remove any more, it's going to cost dearly to remove those electrons. Let me, let's take a look at another one. We want. Um, we know that uh, magnesium is going to lose two electrons. So let's take a look at magnesium. So to remove the first electron, it's going to cost 738 kilojoules to do it. To remove the second electron, it's going to cost 14, uh, 1450 kilojoules. But in order to remove the third electron, so once it removes that second electron, it's now isoelectronic with uh, with neon. Okay. But to remove the next electron, it's going to cost 7,730 kilojoules to do so. And then 10,500 kilojoules to remove the next one, 13,000 kilojoules to remove the next one, and then 18,000 kilojoules. So there's actually a natural barrier here where it's like if you want to, if you want to remove another electron, it's going to cost you a lot of energy. And unfortunately, or you know, depending on, on what you're doing, reactions won't be able to provide that much energy unless you're doing like molten stuff okay so it's kind of nice when you're looking at these when you're looking at this data it's telling you that you know nature prefers stuff to be in their noble gas configuration all right and so here's our periodic table that shows us that ionization energy is increasing as you go from bottom to top and from left to right all right, just like effective nuclear charge. All right, so that's ionization energy. Let's talk about electron affinity. So let's talk about electron affinity. This is going to be the negative of the energy change that occurs when an electron is accepted by an atom in the gas state to form an anion. Oops. Okay. So in other words, it costs energy in order for us to accept an electron. Now, a lot of times that energy, we're going to get some energy back when, when you have a species that accepts an electron. So that's, that's kind of the nice thing. So it costs us energy to remove an electron. It also costs us energy to gain an electron. But usually that gain, we're getting some back. We're getting some energy back. So in other words, what we're looking at with electron affinity is how much energy does it cost to take in an electron? What does a number, what does an electron affinity number look like? Or what does it interpret? How do we interpret one of these? 
So the way that we interpret at large positive electron affinity means that the anion is very stable and wants to take in an electron. Okay, so let's take a look at some values so that way we can kind of get a sense of what we're looking at. So here's a simple periodic table. Let's take a look at ions we know want to take in a want to take in an electron. So fluorine. Fluorine's value is 328 kilojoules per mole. Chlorine's value is 349 kilojoules per mole. So bromine, bromine's value is 325 kilojoules per mole. Okay. What about elements that don't necessarily want to take in electrons? Here's lithium, 60. Sodium, 53. Magnesium's close to zero. Calcium, 2.4. So here it is. The larger the number, the more likely an electron, uh, this atom wants to take in electrons. And so there it is. So th this pretty much confirms what we knew all along, that families 5A, 6A, and 7A tend to want to take in electrons. 1A, 2A, and 3A don't. Okay. And so we, if we look at the periodic table and try to figure out some trends, let's take a look. Uh, here's family 7A. I'm going to circle them. Even except for the hiccup right here with chlorine, the trend is that as you go down a family, as you go down a family, the ionization, the uh, the electron affinity in decreases. So again, if we draw that periodic table out, so here's my simple periodic table. Uh, <laughs> uh, electron affinity will increase as you go from bottom to top. Okay. And ionization in, I mean, electron affinity will increase as you go from left to right. So if you think about this, now, now that we're getting closer to the end, ionization energy increases in the same trend. So does electron affinity and so does effective nuclear charge. So that's really nice. That's really nice. So the only one that bucks this is going to be atomic radius. Okay, so let's take a look at this last one, electronegativity. Excuse me. So like like I said, this is going to be, this is what I'm introducing now. This is actually, this is the last of the trends. This is something that we're going to take a look at more in the next chapter, in chapter 10, when we start looking at bonding. Okay, but I want to bring this up now because we're talking about periodic trends. So electronegativity, this is the atom's ability This is the atom's ability to attract towards itself the electrons in a chemical bond. Okay, and elements that have a high electronegativity are going to have a greater ability to attract electrons. And the one, the atom that has, or the element that has the highest electronegativity is fluorine. So fluorine has an electronegative uh, value of, of, of 4.0. And so the reason why we care about this is that knowing the difference in electronegativity, uh, neg electronegativity between two atoms in a bond is going to tell us how this bond's going to behave. Is it going to be nonpolar? Is it going to be polar or is it going to be ionic? So it's going to tell us the type of bond that we're dealing with. And that's what, what we're going to look at next week. So when we look at the periodic table, electronegativity increases, again, as you go from bottom to top uh, for a family and then from left to right across a period. Okay. And what we're looking at over here, we're graphing the same data. Again, it's confirming that the periodic table increases as you go from bottom to top for a family and then from left to right for a period. Okay.
So, before we leave the periodic table behind, there's one more topic I want to introduce really quickly, and that is the variation in chemical properties of the main group elements. So, you'll remember that elements in the fame, same family have similar electronic configurations, and so they have similar chemical behavior. It turns out that there's another relationship that's possible, and those are diagonal relationships. So a diagonal relationship, what this is, these are similarities. between pairs of elements in different groups and periods in the periodic table. Okay, so the reason for this is the closeness of the charge densities of the cations. So the way that we calculate charge density is that charge density is the charge of an ion divided by its volume. And so cations with comparable charge densities reactor are going to react similarly with anions and they are going to form the same type of, of compound. So that means that the chemistry of lithium is going to be similar to magnesium, beryllium is going to be similar to aluminum, and so on. So that's kind of one of those cool things about the periodic table.